But this morning, before I kind of actually get to the, the message, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, starting May 7th will be the, uh, the 21 day fast. Um, they call it the Isaiah 62 fast. And, you know, originally it started, it was going to be more of an IHOP thing because it was their 24th anniversary of, of starting IHOP. And then, but it was also the 40th year, same day, of that original 21 day fast. Um, started in 1983. And, and again, that's where several of our uh, members here were involved in that clear back in that, you know, 40 years ago. And so for me, it's a really important time believing that uh, that not only, and the main focus of it for them is about Israel, praying for Israel, because right now they're, well, actually May 14th will be their 75th anniversary as a nation. And they're at a very dangerous time because kind of like here, there's a big division right now in Israel. And actually even a, a fear of civil war. Not to mention the fact that all the nations surrounding them are hostile to them. And so there's a, with Iran now getting very close to uh, creating a, a nuclear weapon, they have said they will not let that happen, which would mean there would have to be some type, most likely a war. So it's a very dangerous time for them. And so they're focusing their prayer on that. <clears throat> and I will be doing that too, probably later talking about, uh, you know, some of the scriptures from Isaiah 62 and Romans 11 and, and just going over some of those things throughout that, that period of 21 days. And it's interesting that it ends on, of course, the 28th, and that will be also is Pentecost, which I thought very interesting how all that timing worked out. Now, right now, what started again, as I said, kind of a I help Kansas City thing, has now turned into they already already have a, a million intercessors signed up to pray during those 21 days, at least an hour for Israel. And what's even more astounding is they have a hundred million people who have signed up to pray on the 28th. So I don't think we've ever had that a united front coming together across the nations of the world to focus on the nation of Israel. So keep that in mind and realize that that's coming up. And actually to be our Bibles and brunch, that's fine because different people will be doing Daniel fasts or may not be fasting at all or may be doing fasting on social media. There's a lot of different ways you, you can do that. And the most important thing probably is to focus on the prayer for Israel and for revival for our nation. All right. So I'm going to start in Ephesians 6. I'm going to read a verse that we read the last time when we did that, talking about <clears throat> Resurrection Sunday and, and how while they were expecting a Messiah, they were not expecting a Messiah, a suffering servant who would be killed and would have to lay down his life. And we read a scripture out of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. It says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So if I was to ask you, okay, what are those spiritual powers? What are those things? What, what's he talking about? Most of you would probably answer and say, well, if it's fallen angels. And I would say, yes. I know, just because angel, actually the word angel in Greek means messenger. It, it, rather than, than speaking of an entity, it's actually speaking of a job description. Okay? Because there's a whole lot of other, as we can see from that scripture, there's a hierarchy. There's lower level demons, there's up to principalities, uh, 
spiritual beings that are over nations, like in Daniel. You know, when we come to Daniel and, and, and Gabriel's trying to come and he's fighting the prince of Persia, a high level demon. And he has to have Michael come, the archangel, which shows, again, a hierarchy within the powers of light to come to have fight with him, for him. So it's a hierarchy. Now today, it's going to be, I call this a deeper dive, because a lot of times when you you, you try to cheat, you're, you're trying to get a place where most people are at, and yet we have people here who maybe, you know, the first time they've read their Bible through, maybe. We've got others who've been here 40, 50 years that have gone through the Bible, read diligently through. So you're always trying to reach a place where it applies to everyone. But I think what we need to understand is that when we read the Bible, we read it as 21st century Americans. And that's wrong. It's application. We need to read it as a first century Jew. We need to have their viewpoint of what of how they viewed the war, the world at that time. Now it isn't until our generation that we have so much more depth of knowledge because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now when you think of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're probably thinking first of all of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and that's, that is part of it. And every book in the Old Testament, they have translated, brought it back so we know that this word is correct because this was done like 100 to 200 years before Christ came. But it wasn't only about the Old Testament. They also did commentaries on the Old Testament, which formed their worldview. Now, the ones who did this were the Essenes. The Essenes were a group like, you know, we have these Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had the Essenes. Now, they lived out in Qumran, which was out kind of towards the Dead Sea. And they're the ones who copied all this, who wrote these things out. And started in 1947, was the first one that they found. And then since that time, they've been, found, been finding more, and they've been uh, translating more. And, and again, it's, it's really fascinating. And, they, and a lot of, as we're going to look at some of these, a lot of their influence also came from the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch is not in our Bible, but it is in the Ethiopian Bible. It is also quoted in the Book of Jude. So it helped form their viewpoint, how they looked at the supernatural world. And so that's what I want us to do today. Because if I ask you, okay, what about the fall? Why is the world in such a mess as it is? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do, why is there sin? Why is there murder? Why are there wars? Why? And I think most of you would say, well, because of the fall, you know, Genesis 3, where, where Adam and Eve fell, and that is partially true, but there are actually three different rebellions that the Jews consider. So we're going to go back to Genesis. So go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Just going to look at one verse there, verse 28. So verse 28 said, God blessed them, talking about man, Adam and Eve, okay? God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in numbers, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over it, the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So Josh, you're supposed to have dominion over the fish. Just let you know that. So, now this is called uh, the dominion mandate, or uh, in other words, this was what God's 
original plan was that, that Adam and Eve and their children and grandchildren would fill the earth. Because see, Eve or Eden was just a small area. But it was an area where God reigned, where everything was perfect. It was called paradise. And so they were supposed to take that and go out to the, the rest of the world, which was in darkness. Obviously, they failed because of what happened in Genesis 3 with the, with the fall. Now, there are uh, Christians today, there's a, uh, a lot of people have a, a post-millennial outlook. They have a, a what's called a dominion a doctrine or a dominion mandate that they believe that taking this verse, that Christians will one day basically take over the earth. In other words, we will uh, evangelize everyone in the world and we will have godly laws and we will set everything right and then Jesus will come. Now, I don't have that view, but there are people who do. Uh, I, my outlook is more that it's going to be a remnant. It's always going to be a remnant throughout all the scripture and will be a remnant at the end. But, I think we should live like we believe that. In other words, we should live like we're going to get as many souls into the kingdom of God as we can. We're going to make godly laws when we can. We're going to vote. We're going to do the things we know to do. Okay? Now, Genesis 3 was, you know, the part is where Adam and Eve fell. And just make one comment on that because everybody should be familiar with that. But, you know, the serpent, the Hebrew word for serpent is Nahash. And I want you to think about that. What did Jesus call the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He called them serpents and he called them vipers. Now, were they actually serpents or vipers? I'll just leave that there for you to ponder. But I want to go on to the second rebellion. And we're going to find that in Genesis chapter 6. In verse 1. And you probably won't hear too many messages on this. Probably, some of you probably never, never heard a message on this part. Verse 1, when men began to increase in numbers on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, and that is Elohim, sons of God, that means they are gods, that's another way we, we might categorize all of them as angels, which is fine, but in a way, sons of God, others are celestial beings. Uh, Enoch uses the term watchers. So the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, and his days will be a hundred and twenty years. Now the Nephilim, and that word means giants, were on the earth in these days, and also afterwards. When the sons of God, these divine beings, went into the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. So these supernatural beings, if you want to use the term angels, fine, they rebelled and they went to earth, took women as wives, created a hybrid race. Okay? And they were called giants. That's where we get the word giant. And you notice it also says there was before and after. And that kind of creates a problem because we go, this is why the Lord had to send the flood to kill all humanity except for Noah and his family. Because things have become so corrupt, the bloodline was corrupt. Which is another reason when the children of Israel went to the uh, promised land, we could never figure out why, why, did, why would God tell them to kill every man, woman, and child? I mean, that's genocide. Well, 
want to stir all the peace of the earth. And, uh, and as far as the uh, giants, obviously, even after this, David had to deal with some giants, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So, the whole culture, the whole human race was, was becoming basically hybrids. It's almost like what we're trying to do now scientifically, with the singularity, with making men and machines together. And so God, because of the evil, and we know from the book of, of, of Enoch that the things they taught the people, these giants, these, these half-breeds, were things about war, how to make war weapons, how to uh, use seduction, how to worship astrology, the stars, the false gods. And the violence, as you read on through Genesis 6, was so bad that the Lord regretted that he made it and he had destroyed everyone but him, but except for Noah and his family. Now also in that passage it says, God said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So some scholars believe that it was 120 years from there to the flood. Uh, there are others who believe, because before this, people lived 900, 800, 600, 700 years, and that the lifespan of humans would be begin to be limited more to 120. So, let's go to the New Testament and let's see where it refers to this. So we go first to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, but I think I'm going to read that starting in verse 1 because Peter, I'm going to be reading Jude just a second. They're making an assumption. They're making the assumption that you, the reader, knows what he's talking about. Okay? So he's going to make a comparison between, between the false teachers and what happened earlier. So in verse 1, it says, But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, there's always about false prophets. In the New Testament, there's a lot more emphasis on false teachers. They were secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on himself. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of the truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their combination has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Okay, verse 4. So he's making a comparison here. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but he sent them to hell, or subversion of St. Tartarus, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Okay, so he's referring back to that, and he has, a, again, an assumption that we all know what he's talking about. And unless you have that, that worldview, you might be going, well, what's that all about? But it, it's referring back to Genesis chapter 6. And then as it goes on that passage, he, he also talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a, a sexual component in that. And there usually is with a cult, there would be a sexual component that goes along with that. Now, if you drop down to verse 10, in that passage. And he's talking about these false teachers. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings, 
Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. So it's also kind of a warning in there for us, because part of our job description is, is to heal people, uh, to bring uh, deliverance from demonic bondages, to pray for people, to be set free. But there's a difference in praying for somebody who has a demon as to try to take on a territorial spirit or a spirit over a nation. So unless you're called to do that, and you have a lot of back, you know, prayer back support, you probably don't want to do that. Do you know in the Old Testament, you know how many exorcisms there were? None. No demons were ever cast out of anybody because the kingdom of God did not break in until Jesus came. And we were empowered to do that. And we knew when that was going to happen. We knew the, the general time frame because in Daniel, where he talks about the four different uh, powers, the Babylonian, then the, the per Bisha, Persian, Persians and Medes, uh, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire, the fourth, and be during that time that the Messiah would come. All right, turn right, look right before Revelation, the book of Jude. It's only one chapter. Uh, he is the uh, half brother of Jesus. We'll learn something very similar, verses five through seven. <coughs> And it says, verse 5, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Verse 6, and the angels who do not keep their position of authority, but abandon their own homes, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change. For judgment on that great day. And then it goes on to compare verse 7, similar to the way the Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fires. And if you go down to verse 8. It says, In the same way, these grievers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said the Lord rebuked. So again, we have that same warning. Now, Jude 14, verse 14, Enoch, and the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. You should have quotation marks there. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly godly acts they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So that's quoted uh, word for word right out of the book of Enoch. Okay. So that's the second rebellion. Now we'll go to the third rebellion, which is in Genesis, back to Genesis, chapter 11 this time. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. So I answer the flood. Okay, after that time, 
and it's just Noah and Noah's family. They begin, they begin to increase, they spread, they, they're growing, and so the world is being repopulated again. And so in, in chapter 10, it's all about the tables of the nations, and there's 70 nations there. And that is why you have to look at the parallels. Like in the New Testament, first Jesus sends out the 12, and then he sent out the 70. Why did they send out the 70? Because there were 70 nations and it represented the retaking of the world. And that's why Paul was such uh, adamant about trying to get to Spain. Because the farthest west nation was Spain. And so he writes to the, you know, the Romans saying, well, I got to get to Spain. And well, why does he have to get to Spain? Because that was the, the farthest west of the seventy nations. And we don't know whether he did or not. Alright. Chapter 11. Tower of Babel. Bible. Now the whole world had one language. And a common speech. As men moved eastward. They found a plain in Shinar. And set, settled there. Now they said to each other. Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, there's nothing they plan to do that will be impossible for them. Come let us, you know it's a plural, come let us go down and confuse your language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel. Because of the Lord confused the languages of the whole earth, from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And what the scholars believe they were building, as you might picture a tower, it's more like a ziggurat. You see those, uh, you find rooms with those throughout the Middle East. And what's interesting is you also find those in Mexico, Central America, South America, like the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans, they all built those same things. And they would use them to sacrifice, make human sacrifices, actually on top of them. And they would worship their gods, their demons. We were in Colorado about <clears throat> trying to fight in five years to <clears throat> stay that area. Out of, in a condo, <clears throat> and in this condo, uh, they had a big book about Colorado, and we were in Frisco, and, and so I was just looking through it, and it gives the kind of history, and had pictures, and all that stuff, and, and I was looking through it, I got to one place, and, uh, and it had uh, engravings in a cave, and it was by the Ute Indians. And it said, and we worship Baal. North American Indians worshiping what was the Middle East God. And it's like, how, how did that, you know, how did that, how did they know that? How did, you know, how did that happen? I thought, wow. That is so interesting. They're worshiping the same demons, the same fallen watchers as they are in the Middle East. And, of course, Israel had probably that all throughout their history. They kept idolatry was their sin. That's why they were driven out of the land, because of idolatry. They kept going to other gods. Okay, so, so the Lord has scattered people all over. Confuse the language, 
and they, they begin to, to spread out. Okay, this is where we come to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Because this is part of the song of Moses. And what he's doing throughout this whole chapter, he's talking about basically the history of mankind, the history of Israel. Okay, but, but this part starting in verse 8 is before Israel. Okay, he's talking about, uh, in verse 8, talking about the Tower of Babel. And so in verse 8 says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, Okay, when he divided all mankind, talking about our Bible, he set boundaries up for all the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Now, in your Bible, it may say according to the number of the sons of Israel. That's wrong. You know that from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the sons of God. So when he scattered them, these other nations were given to other gods. But he says, my people will be Israel. So this is before Abraham, before Israel's even you know, a thought yet. But he said, I'm going to make this people, mine, and he gave them the covenant, Sinai covenant, he gave them his, his uh, laws, how to live, all those things, he was care for them. <clears throat> but all these other nations were put under other gods. And these other gods, like in the book of Enoch, they're always called watchers. Okay? And so what's in God's heart is again what was in Genesis 1, that all of the earth is his inheritance and will be his inheritance. And so when Jesus arrives on the scene, all of a sudden, that process begins to break in. That process of reclaiming the earth and taking back from the powers of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of light. Now there's a psalm, Psalm 82, that goes along with this. I'm going to turn back there. So I know this is kind of a lot to take in. But at the same time, it's important. We're going to read this whole Psalm, Psalm 82. It says, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgments among the gods, with Elohim, plural gods. So he presides. The Lord has a, a assembly. He has a divine council. And if if you go to example, one is uh, one of my favorite prophets, Micaiah, who um, is talking to Ahab and to Jehoshaphat, and it goes in the background of it, and it says, and the Lord is talking to his council, and says, well, who will go and put a, and one of the spirits in his divine council? I will go put a lying spirit in their prophets. And he said, go do it. So he has this assembly. He has a, a council. Not that he has need. He's completely sufficient in himself. <clears throat> but his desire is to work with humans, us, that need us. He desires us. He doesn't need these other spiritual beings. And obviously, one thing you can tell is that they all have free choice. That's why these angels choose to do what they want them to do. Some of them left. Many of them, of course, are, are loyal. The same with us. We have opportunity to either reject or receive Christ to make that decision. So it said, God resides in the great assembly. He gives judgments among the gods. So he's speaking to these gods in verse 2. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? 
Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hands of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Verse 6. I said you are gods, and you are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. So we are in that process now of getting God, the Lord, his inheritance. Now to give you another example, Job, which is right before. Psalms. Job 28, 38. Sorry. And this is where in the previous chapter, chapter 37, you know, Job is complaining to the Lord. So then in verse chapter 38, he begins to answer Job. And he said, Then the Lord answered Job. Out of the storm, he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Were you there when I laid the foundation for the earth? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On um, what were its footing set? Or who laid the cornerstone? while the morning stars sang together, and the angels shouted for joy. So before the creation of the earth, angels, these, these supernatural beings, were with him. That's why, even if you think about Genesis 1, it says, let us make man in our image. It's talking about us. And there's no one like the Most High, no one like Yahweh. These are all we would use the term little G, they're just supernatural beings. So in all of this, what's the Lord's purpose? Well, the Lord's purpose is that a family. He desires a family. Again, he is not you know, disinfect, you know, he's not he's sufficient in himself. He doesn't need us, but he wants a supernatural family and a human family. All of which have three choices to either choose him or to reject him. And to receive his love or to reject that love. But he desires for us to receive his love and to love him in return. And so as you look at it, we are born into a battleground. It's a cosmic battle going on. You know, these spiritual beings in the heavenly realms, in the earthly realms. And so we are born in a battleground. And that's why we have to put on a full armor of God. Now, the good news for us is, as we have the New Testament, obviously, we know how it ends. It ends with the defeat of all these. Dogs, little G, who have rebelled against the Lord. And he will come and he will set what once was paradise, Eden, and that will cover the entire earth. Everything will be perfect as a new Jerusalem comes down and a re, then remodeled. New earth where everything will be perfect. But it, as we read scripture, though, we have to realize and have that, that mindset of the first century Jew, what's called the, the second uh, temple period, which was about, you know, when the last second temple was built and until the New Testament. There's about a 400 year period in between the New Testament and the Old Testament. 
And they call that kind of the silent years. But now we have so much more knowledge as we, as we have the New Testament. We understand so much more. But again, we have to read, especially when you get to Revelations, you need to read Revelation with that eye because John is using, referring back to things in the Old Testament continually. It's about the Old Testament. It's about making comparisons to what happened, what's going to happen. And unless you have that viewpoint, it's hard. But the, every first century Jew would know this. So when they read Jude, when they read Second Peter, they knew what he was talking about. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And so we just need to have that mindset of thinking about a first century Jew, how they viewed the world, and also realizing at the same time that we have so much more now because we know how the thing ends. And we know how we have the New Testament. And we have, and that's why the Jews at the time, you think of the time of Christ, why they were so, uh, it was all about Israel. And even Jesus told them, go, don't go to the Gentiles yet. Go to the house of Israel, the lost house of the sheep of Israel. And so they didn't really have a mindset. It was kind of like, this is our deal, you know. You know, this is our religion, you Gentiles. But the Lord had a different plan. He was going to fill the whole earth and every nation, every language. Everyone was going to be able to have an opportunity to come into the kingdom of God. And so there is a supernatural problem. You know, we're not to be in fear, but we ought to be aware that there are supernatural forces. And I think as we get closer and closer to the end time, we're going to see more and more of a manifestation of that evil. And I think even today we'll begin to see, it seems though like there's been a, a spirit of murder has been, has been released. With mass killings, with, with people who are, are shooting up and killing others, and then they're all, for the most part, always killing themselves. A spirit of death that is increasing in our midst. And it's not flesh and blood, Fighting against is these is the spirits that are behind Amen. these things. Amen. And so we have to be aware and focus. All right, Jesse, can you go ahead and come up and we'll uh, change gears a little bit? So again, this is kind of a little deep and a little you know something you probably haven't ever heard necessarily, especially on a Sunday morning, but we need to have that viewpoint. That what has happened in the past affects things today. And there's many believe that some of those things that happened in the past we may be see having happen again. And to be aware. <clears throat> but this morning, okay, so we can kind of clear our minds and lay that aside. And let's just focus on the Lord. Because He He's so awesome. Yes. So awesome. That He had this plan. But none of these things have happened, these, these three different rebellions that happened in the Old Testament, they were not a surprise. He has a purpose in them. And if we just gazed upon the Lord, gazed upon his beauty, and what he has done for us, that he has made us new creations. Christ Jesus, that we have eternity to stand with him, that he is the healer, he is the great physician, it's by the stripes of Jesus that we are healed. So Lord, we welcome you, we welcome you Holy Spirit, so we ask right now that every need. Lord, that you would come and touch your people. As we open our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, as we welcome you, Holy Spirit, and we know it's not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit, says the Lord. I know, Lord, we know that knowledge puffs up 
But Lord, we want to be humble. But we want to have the mind of Christ. And we want to understand things. So Lord, we ask that you would come as we offer ourselves before you now. And that you would meet us. So anyone who would like prayer, feel free to come up. For healing, for whatever it may be. For the rest, to just soak in his presence and let him minister 